<laughs> Hello, everyone. This is IITT number 19. We're doing a good job. And uh, today we're going to talk about a very important subject, actually one of the subject that is very critical and I've seen a lot of problems around practitioners regarding this subject and uh, we have great speakers with us. I'm going to share my screen and introduce you. So we have with us the secretary of TC103 on numerical uh, methods, um, Dr. Francesca Seccato, lecturer, Department of Civil and Vital Engineering in Padua, Italy. Welcome. Professor Fuzuoka, emeritus from Kyoto University from Japan specialist in computational uh, geomechanics, welcome. Chia Wang Bun, geotechnical design manager, also expert in numerical methods, even at a young age, a winner of a BSL award, welcome. Thank Hamza, you. I welcome call on. him the hero of the uh, Arab uh, Peninsula. He's very well known uh, in numerical methods. A lecturer also, a designer. Welcome to all of you. I'm going to start by giving the floor to Francesca to tell us a little bit about this TC and the activities and, and uh, we'll take turns. Again, this is an interactive talk. If you feel that we have uh, a remark uh, or an extra complimentary uh, um, information that will be useful for the viewers. Uh, it's a friendly talk, so help me do that. I've been doing it in the past, but we're all one team uh, in the best interest of uh, education regarding the subject. So we're covering about 40 subspecialties of geotechnical engineering. This is one of them, number 19. And the floor is yours, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen. Okay. If we mute our uh, the other speakers, unless we have to talk, it's better for background noise. Sure. I am the secretary of TC103 on numerical method. And uh, this is one of the TC about fundamentals. And uh, it's a technical committee that discusses the use of computational tool and the development of advanced numerical methods. Uh, typically, our members work, for example, on positive model development of accurate or robust and new efficient method and uh, the application to different fields of uh, geomechanics. At the moment, uh, our TC count 96 members from uh, 35 different uh, countries. And uh, the chair is Professor Akira Murakami from Kyoto, Japan. And the vice chair is uh, Professor Helmut Feiger from Gar, uh, Austria. Uh, our activities are, for example, uh, organization of uh, invited session at thematic conferences, and last year, we started our series of uh, honor lectures, uh, the Scott Sloan lecture in honor of Professor Scott Sloan. The first one was given by Professor David Pott in uh, one year ago, more or less, at Numji conference in uh, London. Uh, moreover, we tried to um, diffuse the culture of numerical methods, delivering webinar for the ISSS MG Virtual University. And we collaborate with the other TCs, for example, TC 206 and 306 for different topics. Uh, at the moment, we have these two close collaboration, but I believe that in the future, this will increase because the use of numerical method is uh, very diffuse. Uh, and so there is room for uh, um, interaction with the other TCs. 
Um, for example, uh, uh, two years ago, we circulated a survey among the um, members of all the PCs of SFMG, uh, asking how often do you use numerical method in your work? And uh, more than 65% of the people say that uh, they use it every day or at least once a week. There were only three people saying that uh, they never used numerical method. And when we asked them why, it was uh, two, two people say, because somebody else is doing that for me, uh, or one say that uh, doesn't rely uh, on, on the results. So it means that uh, these Four person people, that... Francesca, you can add one more. You, yes. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So probably these no, people I... don't use the method, but the results. I think, yeah, no, because you? I, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, yeah. I'm not doing it myself, but we check That's the somebody, results yeah. and check. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is what nice. we expected, more or less. Um, indeed, numerical methods are used in many fields, both in research and for practical applications. So, both for uh, serviceability limit state design, but also for uh, ultimate uh, limit state. Um, uh, design. Um, before we move forward with uh, the other uh, talk, uh, I would like to give uh, a very short introduction on the steps that we take when we do computational modeling in geomechanics. This is something very basic, but I would like to highlight it because uh, it's good to remember. Um, so when we start, we want to build a numerical model, the first step is the observation of reality. So we have to look to the real problem and ask ourselves, what do we want to study? Why do we need a model? And then when we understand our physical um, problem, we move forward to the idealization of this problem. And uh, this means that we need to understand and decide what are the key aspects of the model that we have to consider. This traduces mathematically to the uh, selection of the governing equation, mass balance, momentum balance, water, only dry soil, and so on. And the soil constitutive model, which is very uh, difficult. Um, when we idealize soil, we encounter a fundamental duality because although soil is inherent a discrete medium, it is often modeled as a continuum. So this duality arises because at a small scale, soil behavior is governed by the interaction between individual particles. But for practical analysis, since we need to simplify our problem, soil is uh, typically treated as a continuum medium. So when we decide to treat it as a continuum medium, we have a set of governing equations like mass balance, energy balance, and so on. And these are typically written as a partial differential equation that we need to solve some way. Uh, so the following step is to discretize the model in time and space. We need to decide the boundary condition, the geometry of the model, and so on. If we go uh, for the discrete model and we model the single particles and the interaction between them, we have a DM model, discrete element model. In this case, the discretization is automatic. Uh, obviously, it's more difficult to, <clears throat> to solve. Um, <clears throat> among the continuum methods, uh, here I decided to divide two group, main group of uh, methods, but uh, I think that other uh, specialists will do their own uh, division. I divide the mesh-based method, so those ones that relies on the mesh of finite element or a grid to solve the governing equation of, of motion, like the finite difference method, the finite element method, and so on. And the point-based method that are raising a lot in the last decade. And these are continuum-based method, but the continuum is discretized with a set of points that has all the property of the material. And these are SPH, PFM, MPM, and many others. Okay, so once we have built our uh, numerical model with uh, these uh, three steps, we need to solve it. 
And uh, here we need an efficient and reliable algorithm. So here it opens a big question of uh, reliability and accuracy of the method. Thanks to this step, we will finally get our result. But uh, work is not finished because uh, we need to validate or verify the result. So we need to ask ourselves, are the results reasonable? Are we getting the result that we need? So, and this means that we need to go back to the real problem and use engineering judgment to understand if the model gave us the correct uh, answers. Uh, this I think is a very important step and sometimes in practice, but maybe also in research, it's not done properly. Uh, but this is really, is really important. So numerical modeling requires engineering judgment always <laughs> this is super important <laughs> this is crazy important that's yeah. why i want to tell you a quick story when i was uh doing my phd i was helping uh, with the research uh, another fellow phd student and we did full load testing famous paper at texas a&m university where we did load tests and we did so many uh, soil testing uh, with the SPT, CPT, DMT, BST, uh, PMT, pressure meter. We gave all the data to 300 engineers around the world and consultants. We did not give them the results of the load settlement behavior of five footings. And we asked them to use any method any data they want to determine the load settlement curve of the five footings. And then we grabbed all this database and we start comparing the methods. I don't want to go into comparing initial data like those who used SPT alone, we see how they made did. Those who used CPT, I leave this for later. But if you look at those who used finite element, the best method was finite element. At the time, it was abacus, if you know abacus. So that gave the best uh, fit for load segment curve. Do you know which was the worst method? I, uh, finite I element wanna... also. <laughs> <laughs> so finite element is a very powerful tool, but you have to know who is using it. That's why you are here. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, the judgment <laughs> totally that you're talking about is so important. Keep going, yeah. Francesca. You got Thanks. me excited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You're right. You know, I, I always repeat this also to my students and practitioners because sometimes, uh, you know, you get the results very fast. You don't think enough on the problem, but this is very dangerous. So I want to repeat here. Um. So regarding the um, use of the numerical method, uh, the most used one seems to be finite element and the uh, finite uh, difference. Probably this is because of the, well, they are quite old, but uh, also because of the software availability, many commercial code, uh, also open source code. But uh, there are there is an incre increasing use of DEM and uh, NPM. Uh, mainly in uh, in research, but also sometimes in practice, and I believe that these two maybe in the future will uh, will uh, will increase. So uh, during that survey that I mentioned at the beginning, we also asked what can we do what, what can we do to improve the use of numerical uh, method, and we got many feedback quite a nice one, but uh, overall what um, came up is that we need to invest more in education. So thank you also for organizing this talk because I, I, I think it contributes to this. Uh, education at all level, at the university, but also for practitioners and so on. Um, somebody also mentioned that uh, it would be useful to update design criteria and national standard to increase the availability of code, uh, decrease the prices of the softwares that are commercial and so on, and also work on the accuracy and the robustness of, of this software. 
So to conclude, I would like to end this talk with some consideration. Uh, clearly, numerical methods are widely used in all fields of geotechnical engineering and rock mechanics in research and in practice. Uh, but modeling process require engineering no knowledge. And don't forget that uh, numer a numerical model is a representation of reality. So here I put this uh, very famous um, painting from uh, Magritte, Cetit ne Pompe. Indeed, it's only a representation of this object. Uh, at the same time, a model is not the reality. It's a representation of reality. So the figure that you see on the, on the right uh, is not a dam, it's a representation of the dam for some purposes. Here I close my talk and if you have some consideration. Wonderful, wonderful. Francesca, thank you so much for giving uh, this global view. Uh, and Bye. I really, really like this introduction. We can uh, move to Professor Oka for to see how powerful this tool is in research. Uh, go ahead and share your screen. Okay. Can you see? Is it okay? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. Keep going. Yep. Okay, this uh, this time, I'd like to talk about the evaluation of liquefaction strengths of Japanese natural sandy soil by using the two methods, two te testing methods, three actual and simple shot tests. Yeah, but uh, this uh, topic is uh, closely related to the determination of the parameters of consulting models, okay? Well, uh, the, the simple shell test, cyclic test is, uh, I think is uh, appropriate aid for, to, to assess the, the liquefaction potential because the, the, the loading mode is uh, similar to the, the simple shear conditions. But in, in practice, the, the many uh, people are doing a triaxial test instead of simple shear test. This is due to the technical uh, problems. Yeah, triaxial test is more easier than the original simple shear test, okay? But the, the problem is the, the, the the liquefaction strengths by two methods are not always equal. If it is equal, it's okay, no problem. But uh, sometimes not always equal. So the so look at the, the, the problems that the I have found that the, we are using the shear stress components on different planes in stress space to determine the liquefaction strengths and two tests. Okay, so the special planes, okay, horizontal plane and the 45 degrees planes, etc. So, my conclusion is in order to avoid the prescribed planes, okay, the different planes problem to specify the sure stress, it's, I, I, I would say it's rational to use the stress invariance ratio to determine the liquefaction strength ratio. Okay, we are using the stress ratio, but different uh, stress ratio we are using, but I think it's better to use the stress invariant ratio, it's better. But this is a typical uh, cyclic uh, simple shear test result and the simulated result by constructive model, okay? But uh, the, if we do, but the triaxial test result is not always equal to this uh, the, the, the result, okay? But using the, the, the cyclic shear stress test result, we'll obtain the, the liquefaction strength scale, cyclic strength scale. But in Japan, we take, uh, we determine the strengths at 
the number of cycles 20 around here. Yeah. This is the strength curve of the silica sand, well known the Toyoula sand. The, the the uh, relative density is 70%, okay. But this is a typical result, as, as you know. But if we plot the, the triaxial test result, by the strengths by triaxial test result, and also the liquefaction strength ratio by cyclic torsional horosynda test, or simplicia test, in terms of the conventional, Shear stress ratio, but you can see it's not. It's, this is the one to one corresponding line. So the in this case uh, you can see the in general the torsional hollow cylinder test result is larger than the triaxial test result. Okay. So uh, I will. Uh, I would like to visit the basics of. The, 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 the problems, okay. First, I will talk about the cyclic triaxial condition. As you know, well known, the, the, this is the, the, the strain components of the, the cyclic triaxial conditions under the cyclic triaxial conditions uh, and, uh, and drain, of course. Yeah. In this case, the, uh, the second invariant of the vitrix strain tensor is given by this equation. And so if we take uh, double amplitude actual strain of 5% for the onset of liquefaction, we can obtain the square root of I2 is 4.33%, okay? And then the, 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 the stress con components, very, very clear. The, the shear stress given by deviator divided by two, and the J2 is the second invariant of the vitrix stress tensor. And in this case, square root of 2j2 is 1.633 uh, multiplied by the sigma d deviator stress of uh, by two. Okay, remember this one. And they also they go to the simple shear conditions. This is very simple, uh, strength conditions. In this case, square root of i2 uh, sub I2 is the 3.75% because the 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 7.5% of shear strain correspond to the double amplitude to the actual strain of 5% under triaxial condition. Okay, so we take a, we consider the shear strain of 7.5%. Okay, the, the the stress component is very simple. Okay. Only sigma one two x y yeah etc yeah this one so second invariant of j two uh, two j two is one point four one four multiplied by the the the, the, the shear stress okay uh, the, you can compare the the result for uh, simple shear test in the triaxial conditions okay. Okay, so if the, the shear stress is equal for triaxial and simple shear tests in terms of the second inv uh, stress invariant, J2 over sigma n prime, yeah? Something like that. In that case, the shear stress and the, the triaxial condition is larger than the, 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 the shear stress uh, and the, the simple shear test. 0.866, okay, remember this one. And the, and the vice versa, in contrast, if the shear stress are equal for triaxial and simple shear test in terms of the conventional shear stress, they will have this equation, the, the exact uh, the ratio yeah, of the, the stress invariant. Okay, so, Look, uh, oh, okay, this is the additional uh, uh, information. It's the second invariant of the, the, the strain components divided, uh, the ratio is also the 0 0.866, okay. This is additional information. Okay, so go to the, 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 the real measured uh, result. 
We carried out the simple shot test and the triaxial test for 50 samples, undisturbed and natural sandy soil sample in Japan. And we did the same test and the, for the, the samples, uh, sampled at the same depth of ground. Okay, this is the result as you seen before. Okay, we did uh, the, the, the correlation uh, the, uh, analysis. Okay, we can, uh, a very good uh, correspondence, but the regulation curve, the slope of the regulation curve is not one, 0 0.869, etc. But this value is very close to the theoretical value, 0 0.866. Okay, so this deviation of this one-to-one -one line is natural, theoretically, okay, very natural result, okay. Then if we use the, 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 the stress invariant ratio, uh, this is the, 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 the ordinate is the strength, uh, strength ratio by cyclic reaction test in terms of the stress uh, invariant ratio, okay? And the, the horizontal axis is the, given by the torsion or the simple shell test. Okay, in this case, we can obtain a very strong correlation to, to test results, okay? So the, the regulation curve, the, the slope of the regulation curve is 1.00 around. And the correlation coefficient of 0.743, etc., is enough, okay, for in, in the, uh, for accuracy. Yeah? Okay, so uh, I'd like to summarize my talk. Uh, we obtained the, the good correlation between the liquefaction strengths by triaxial simple shell test using the conventional stress ratio, of course, but. but uh, the, the using the stress invariant ratio, if we use, it, it yields a strong correlation. It means the, the slope of the relation line is 1.0, about 1.0. So I think it's better uh, uh, result. But still, you can see the scattering, okay? Uh, scattering from the one-to-one -one, uh, lines. But it may be uh, attributed to the, the, the uh, soil fabric preloading history, namely that's uh, an isotropy, or the inhomogeneity of the natural samples. Yeah. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Professor, thank you. Uh, this is such an important topic, uh, for especially for those who are in danger earthquake zones and doing testing on liquefaction. Yeah. From about uh, 180 countries worldwide, there are about 50 countries affected by earthquakes, um, 20 of them in serious zones, including Japan. <laughs> so thank <laughs> yeah, you course. so much for yeah, uh, your you. input as an example of using numerical methods. Um, we can give the floor to Dr. Boone. Can you unshare, you. please, Professor Oka? Yes. Okay, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go on, very beautiful and elegant uh, derivation, Professor Oka. I like it. Let me share my screen. So um, good day, um, my name is Boon, and uh, the title of my presentation is The Use of Numerical Methods in Infrastructure Projects. First, I will start with the genesis of numerical methods, then the use of numerical methods and interfaces in infrastructure projects, go through some challenges with uh, numerical modeling via three interesting problems and 
discuss future trends. In terms of the genesis of numerical methods, I would like to first start by sharing a story with the late uh, Professor Scott Sloan. Scott uh, visited Oxford University in 2013, one month before I was about to submit my PhD thesis. One of my supervisors, Professor Guy Holsby, kindly organized a session for me to meet with Scott because I was using linear programming on the creation of jointed block geometry for distinct element modeling. And Scott was using or had been using linear programming for decades. After discussing the mathematics with him, I told Scott that I was slightly concerned that I wasn't completely producing the same results as commercial software, as you can see in the middle, where they would remove dangling joints based on the fracture input on the left. Instead, I would be extending fractures so that they always terminate against an existing fracture. Scott uh, looked at the results and looked at me and said, what you did look more realistic. That uh, immediately boosted my confidence. And many years later, I realized Scott was doing great numerical work because he wasn't concerned with the herd. He created the finite element limit analysis, which is now used widely within the research community and increasingly in the industry. In fact, a good numerical method is an orchestrated assembly of numerical algorithms and data structure management delivered beautifully and like a good piece of music, a good numerical method would last decades and even centuries for friends who are working in numerical methods. Good luck to all of you and hope you create a lifelong numerical method that will last centuries. Now, let me move on to the interfaces and use of numerical methods in large infrastructure projects. In terms of engineering delivery, one would start with the ground model, the analytical model, on-site verification, and uh, monitoring. So before jumping straight into the running the numerical model, as what Dr. Francesca has said, we need to have an overview of the key risks of the project and develop a careful site investigation program to investigate the key parameters that would affect the project. For instance, in the ground model, one may be interested in the soil stratification, the soil parameters, and the groundwater level. And for instance, in ground improvement projects, one may be interested in the compressibility of the soil, the pre-consolidation ratio, and the rates of consolidation, and undrained shear strength near the edges of the embankment. One may wish to have CPT investigations with borehole investigations with undisturbed sampling at the relevant target depth so that we can carry out the right lab test for for testing, as what uh, Professor Oka has discussed in the previous presentation. If deep excavation, in deep excavations, one may be interested in the deformability parameters by carrying out some pressure meter tests and to improve the quality of the input parameter or data, one may wish to use a smaller than usual casing, but not too much larger than the diameter of the pressure meter advance the casing first to reduce the, the seating error. When selecting the numerical method, one will need to ensure that the numerical method is able to investigate the key parameters of concern and carry out some level of sensitivity analysis. The numerical method should be able to replicate the failure mechanism. And if the failure mechanism can't be replicated, then some analytical checks will need to be supplemented. In fact, it is important to have an overview of the geotechnical problem and verify with instrumentation and monitoring 
And depending on the project types, sometimes independent checking may be required. Now, I'd like to share the challenges of numerical modeling via three interesting problems. The first is the use of numerical methods for design. The second is the prediction of settlement induced by volume loss. And third, modeling of geological features. In the use of numerical methods for design, Dr. Brian Simpson, who is widely known, illustrates through this anchored retaining wall. The slope without the retaining wall is in fact stable, but doesn't have, the, doesn't have adequate factor of safety. Using unfactored characteristic values results in very low anchor forces and bending moments in the retaining wall. In these type of problems, design codes or national annex may facilitate designers. Moving on to the next interesting problem. The second one is the prediction and effects of ground movements caused by tunneling in soft ground beneath urban areas and is normally governed by volume loss, which is the percentage of volume as a function of the theoretical bot, the theoretical volume of the bot hole. And is Settlement is normally induced by the overcutting of the material around the PBM, the face pressure governing the material that comes into the excavation chamber, and the relaxation of the ground before pressure grouting behind the TBM tail skin. This slide shows some finite element modeling where the blue line on the left shows excessive heaving using the Moore Coulomb model. In order to get the right trend, one may need to exercise judgment by, for example, tweaking the numerical model by fixing the invert so that the right trend is obtained that as the tunnel goes shallower, we get a deeper and narrower settlement trough. Professor John Berlin similarly said in one of his presentations that the finite element model is particularly sensitive to many parameters, but field observations in reality is relatively insensitive. So going to, when solving greenfield problems like that, it may be more efficient to first decouple the problem, first run an analytical solution first, then check the strain of the building. And if the damage classification is moderate, then only move on to more sophisticated finite element packages to model the, the building foundation with the loading interacting with the soil. Now, going into the third interesting problem, I would like to take this opportunity to showcase one of my past research work on the distinct element modeling of horizontally bedded rock. On the left, you have thick beddings, which would be able to arch across to the abutment. But in terms of deformation, it would de laminate close. The delamination is greatest closest to the roof and the rock bolt forces is shown as the red bars. The rock bolt forces on the left would decay with distance, forming a reinforced rock unit for thick baddings. For thinner baddings, arching cannot span to the abutment, and the beam, the thinner layers are stitched together to form a beam. And you can see that there is a gap formed between the rigid layer and the stitched layers. On the right, this problem was inspired by my visit to Barcelona on the way to Mont Montserrat, where I saw an interbading along the highway. And as you can see here, the rock bolt forces increase with distance, forming a suspension mechanism as the fractured material suspends off the rigid stratum. Now, going on to future trends, there's an increasing number of platforms offering automation, machine learning, and AI through back analysis, automation with Python, and by now everyone would have known ChatGPT. Now, recently I stumbled into a neat jaw technical platform, Chatbot, and if I were to ask certain Earthworks questions related to the transport for New South Wales specifications, it gives the right answer. And if I were to ask a question related to uh, about the bulk density and moisture content, it can it, this chatbot can solve the mathematical equation relatively easy. 
So I think the question is in the future, whether AI can help engineers produce design calculations. I think the answer is yes, but it needs to be supervised by an experienced engineer exercising judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like your conclusion, powerful AI conclusion. <laughs> Always be careful. For sure. Hands up. Are you ready? Yes. I know you have some exciting presentation <laughs> also to share. <laughs> Back eye, hopefully. Let me share the screen. Thank you, Boone. You're welcome. That's uh, visible now, I believe. It's coming, yep. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, uh, everyone. I'm really honored and humbled to be alongside with the great mentors with us today, Dr. Uh, uh, Francesca, Professor Oka, and Dr. Boone. Uh, of course, needless to say, uh, Dr. Mark Belluz. Um Unfortunately, I came from a region that not even on the map, uh, Dr. Francesca showed, uh, despite that major and mega geotechnical and ground engineering projects are taking place in our region, but geotechnical engineering and numerical modeling as well in, in our field is still emerging. Uh, so today we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk about the advanced 3D numerical modeling for foundation and salt dooms with monitoring data integration uh, with a case study from Saudi Arabia. I will focus more on, on the case study and the industrial parts. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues here uh, have covered uh, many uh, conceptual and, and theoretical parts of it, but uh, I'm not promoting ground improvement or micropiles or stone columns uh, because to be honest, uh, one of the main reasons to use the numerical uh, modeling in, in our analysis and then on our daily use as as dr francesca said uh, it's almost 32 percent uh, the engineers are using uh, nowadays the, the finite element and in, in their uh, daily use design uh, is to value engineer and to optimize we have seen many cases and many projects uh, in the region that just because the lack of availability of the tools like the finite element uh, or the numerical modeling, they tend to over-design. They tend to assume bias as necessary where only raft could do it or only shallow foundation could do it. Um, or uh, there is a need for soil improvement by different means while the reality, if we have done the accurate modeling and design, we, we can survive without. So uh, utilizing numerical modeling correctly can can be uh, a value engineering tool to produce optimum designs. Uh, one of the cases I will share uh, quickly, this case in, in Bahrain actually, it was they the client have done um, soil investigation program and they covered the site, not fully, unfortunately. So they encountered that the soil the soil is, is rock, is limestone, and the, the isolated footings was proposed. When they excavated the site, they encountered that 30% of the site is actually sand, was not encountered in the soil report. And when they came back to the soil laboratories, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, uh, have been considered that the soil laboratories are the ultimate geotechnical designers, uh, which is not the case in our region. So they tend to recommend that mass concreting and replacement of the whole one third of the site uh, is the solution to get rid of the differential settlement. But the cost was insane. So we have utilized the numerical modeling uh, on the existing ground conditions. Let it be one third of the raft resting on the soil and the remaining part is resting directly on the rock. There is a differential settlement, but we found out that this is within an acceptable limit and uh, it resulted in a value uh, engineering. Uh, again, this is uh, an example from Saudi Arabia where the client has uh, cast the raft foundation plus four floors. And before they finished the construction, the client just decided to add two more floors. 
And when they use the conventional methods from the soil reports and the analytical data, it's as Dr. Boone said, it's really good and advisable to start with analytical data, but sometimes there is limitations for those analytical data. You cannot use them out of context, which has been used here in, in this case. So they found out that based on the KS subgrade reaction modulus value used in that uh, project resulted in a settlement of 70 millimeter and a soil pressure 260 kBA, which is more than the allowable limits uh, as per the soil reports. However, when we uh, do the numerical modeling for that case, we encountered that the settlement is barely 16 millimeter with the addition of the two floors. Uh, and the saving was huge. Um, again, uh, so basically, just a, basically, you, you did nothing but give uh, confidence to add two only. more floors, right? Exactly, exactly. We told them you don't need to do anything. How much to were you paid? But... Like... <laughs> How much were you the, paid to do this? The, the, this is the lame thing. The design is peanut. Really, is peanut. It can save you millions, but the cost and the fees of it is is peanut. Yeah, we are uh, we are not well paid worldwide. Of course, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah we, we, we are doing it for the excitement uh, and hopefully to change the people uh, mentality and increase the awareness about geotechnical engineering. Uh, it can save you. It can save you not only money, but also some catastrophic events has been happened due to negligence and geotechnical engineering. Uh, one of the very simple cases also, for, uh, for example, this light bulls, uh, they increased the moment uh, because they increased the height of the light pool and they already constructed the, the footing, cylindrical concrete and reinforced footing. And when they did it new, analytically uh, by the conventional methods, they found out there is the, uh, a failure in the foundation and it needs to be strengthened and underbent. But when we uh, run... Uh, numerical 3D anal finite element analysis, we found out, no, it will take the additional loads without failure. Uh, this is a very interesting project. Uh, it go, has been... Go back, go back one slide. Yes. Yeah. Are you testing me in Arabic? Takim amal asasat, takim... Ijra takimat lama asasiya You see? Now you you still, <laughs> you, you still have it. You still have it. Okay, so for uh, for this project, it was actually on hold for several years because uh, it was exceeding the budget of the client. It is part of UNESCO heritage site in Bahrain, an historical area called Muharraq. Uh, so we evaluated the 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 superstructure, which is curvy post tension slabs, and uh, the soil reports. The initial design was piles with pile caps, but we found out that uh, three out of four buildings for this uh, car parks can survive with 350, only 350 millimeter of post-tension draft foundation. And it was completed successfully. Uh, another project we did in Bahrain was actually the world largest uh, micro pile draft project in Bahrain. It was a uh, uh, multi-story buildings or towers up to 22 floors uh, constructed on a reclaimed island and the problem there was there is a shallow aquifer and if you know Bahrain, Bahrain we don't have here um, water resources so any aquifer is considered as national treasure and we don't allow to to create any kind of contamination or disturbance on it so board piles in order to uh, reach to a bearable uh, strata was has to be deeper uh, into the aquifer, which was not allowed. After almost seven years of discussions, field uh, and lab testing, uh, we have decided that the most suitable solution was micropiled post-tension draft. We installed almost 12,000 micropiles uh, to support 70,000 square meter uh, raft foundation. Uh, we have 120 microbial static load test. Uh, despite this uh, huge amount of microbials, because it's microbials small, we still have a saving in terms of concrete and in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the load sharing on the microbials was approximately 65%. And we do have instrumentation installed uh, and uh, the project is completed. So I can show you really quick the, the result. This is the highest building two towers 
These are the instrumentation where we have installed it. And this is the comparison between the geotechnical analysis, the structural analysis, and uh, the site measurement or the, the field data. Um, the field data is way below, almost 50% below the, the what we have predicted. But this is mainly due to the load. Uh, the load was not uh, yet uh, uh, it's in its final stage. We are talking about the dead load and the superimposed dead load, but not yet the live load. It's not occupied yet. So this could be uh, one of the reasons. We have run uh, artificial intelligence and various uh, machine learning uh, to do a sensitivity analysis and identify the most uh, influential parameters that are affecting the, the, the microbial response uh, in this foundation. And we did sensitivity analysis in terms of the number of the microbials, the spacing, the configuration, and also the, the mesh uh, uh, size. We identify also the, the most influential parameters, of course, as Dr. Francesca said, mesh-based finite element. So we, we are expecting the mesh to have great influence on, on the result. Uh, this is, uh, we have used HSS, uh, hardening soil with small strain assessment model. So these are the most influential factors out of these models on our uh, micropiles. Uh, this is the micropile load test calibration or back calculation. And we did a, an automation because we noticed that when we try to cal back calculate and calibrate the numerical models uh, or the pile using the pile load test or plate load test, it takes really uh, time, especially with, with the advanced uh, modeling. So we did a uh, develop uh, algorithm to automate the calibration process. And in 30 seconds, we can achieve the calibration. So this is before the calibration, the plan. And then we have the uh, red uh, dotted lines as from the field. And after calibration, we have this dashed line with R squared of 0.99. But the actual case study is this Jazan Grain Warehouse uh, in Sol Doom. So Jazan is in the west, uh, uh, south and west of Saudi Arabia. It's on the Red Sea. Uh, area. It's very challenging geologically. Uh, it has Sabha soil, if, if you are aware about this terminology. It has salt dooms for kilometers. Uh, it has organic uh, soil. It, it has collapsible soil. It has uh, floodplains. It has seismic activity. Uh, so the challenge is really uh, uh, is geotechnical for this uh, region in Saudi Arabia. The, the project consists of uh, warehouse, 12,000 square meter, it, it, it's quite wide, and it was nine years old. However, the client did uh, notice that it, it has 170 millimeter of deformation, and they couldn't uh, identify what is the reason. The foundation they used was biles with bile caps and slab on grade. Uh, after assessment, we found out that the biles are doing well, but the problem was in the slab on grade resting uh, or spanning in between the biles. And... Uh, we had four soil laboratories conducting soil testing and investigation there. None of them were in agreement with any of the other, uh, which is reasonable because the, the, the geological This features, is normal. <laughs> it is, it is. And Jazan, to be honest, uh, when, when we dive deep into the geotechnical and the geological maps, we, we found out why they couldn't reach to an agreement. However, oh, when we... Use it is very highly heterogeneous. Uh, is it on the line? So, it, it is exactly on the line, uh, and it is on the board, actually. So this located in the board, uh, it is in the coastal area. And some of them, they say there is a salt doom. Some of them say there is no salt doom. So we are talking about huge discrepancies between the soil laboratories. And despite all of that, we consider it the, the worst case result in those soil reports, we couldn't explain where the 170 millimeter came from. Maximum, we got 70 millimeter. Okay, it's a lot, but it's not 170. Then we we uh, doubt that there is a time factor here. There is a creep uh, taking place, and we don't have a measurement, unfortunately, because the monitoring is not uh, yet a practice in, in our region. So the only solution was to use a remote sensing. We used NSAR technology and we went back in time, uh, the nine years uh, of that building, and we noticed what was the rate of the movement for this building. 
And using that, we use the result of the NSAR to calibrate the creep factor in a numerical constitutive model called N2BC, Norton Double Bower Creep Model, with more column tension cutoff. It used to be called as salt rock model. And after the calibration, we could reach this 170 millimeter. So we did design. Uh, a, of course, the recommendation was to demolish the slab on grade, and then we designed a micro piled post tension slab on grade in between the piles. The original design came to us was 200, uh, uh, 2700, sorry, number of the micro piles, but we reduced it to 800 number of, bio, of micro piles, reducing the section. There is 70% re reduction in the number of the micro piles, 44% reduction in carbon footprint. But the tricky part that we told them the microbiomes will not stop your settlement. We assume the creep will continue, but we asked, did ask them what is the total uh, duration or the design life of your structure. And during that design life, we will ensure that the maximum creep displacement or deformation will be within the acceptable uh, limit. Uh, we did a lot better analysis and, of course, a seismic time history and so sort of dynamic soil structure interaction. And this is actually ongoing as part of my uh, current PhD. This is the project. These are the microbiles in the pink and uh, the existing piles and the black uh, lines. This is after the calibration of the pilot test. These are electrical resistivity tomography for 20 meters below the site. So you can see the, the weak uh, spot here corresponding with the salt uh, dome location. This These are the NSAR uh, readings uh, from the remote sensing for the site. And you can see the whole the whole city is, is really problematic due to the geological challenges it imposed. Uh, this is the calibration with the from the NSAR data with the with the numerical model, and this is the total displacement, the creep displacement. Uh, again, a sensitivity analysis for the number of the micropiles and the spacing, also the mesh. This is the total uh, displacement in the short term, in the long term uh, during the design life of the structure the tilt and rotation, the factor of safety, the load button analysis, because this is a warehouse, so we uh, expect the load not to be applied at once, but in different patterns, uh, the shear wave velocity, uh, the GR relationship for the earthquake data, the liquefaction analysis, uh, and we have a model-based ground motion uh, scaled uh, from an event. And so there, uh, from an event from USA, actually, because unfortunately we couldn't find available public data regarding seismic in, in Saudi Arabia. And we got uh, the response of the microbiomes and the raft uh, system. Accessible water pressure, of course, we used uh, here uh, HSS, which is not the best to capture the excess poor water pressure, the transient. And these are the steps for the microbiomes, the post tensioning, reinforcement concrete, and that's it. So thank you. You did, you did well with long. time. You need to drink some water. You will... <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I did. Hamza, thank you so much. Uh, you showed many good examples on how to save money and uh, be efficient and be good engineers. Uh, again, uh, I agree with Professor Oka, Francesca, and Boone. This is a very important uh, methodology, but we have to use our judgment. I, when I give a lecture, I always tell, especially the young engineers, reduce as simplify as much as possible so you can solve by hand. At least you get the order of magnitude of things. And then you start playing with the powerful tools. Mm -hmm. Always solve by hand. Make sure the units are talking to each other. I mean, and the US will still use feet and pounds. And in my lecture, I show examples of, you know, in, with NASA, how the satellite exploded because they didn't talk about the units together. So this is even more important, how to model the problem how to think about it, 
failure criteria and then use a judgment. The examples were very good. Uh, thank you all for being part of this and IITT. Um, thank, thank you, you for Mampoulos. volunteering. Yes, go ahead. Boon. Thank you for chairing. It's a good pleasure to be speaking today and uh, interact with the other speakers and see the good work that is done by TC103. And uh, thanks for supporting the numerical group. Um, we know that we are not too lonely and always supported by the president. <laughs> Hamza, don't forget, we want all these countries to become members of ISS. Of course, <laughs> of course. I'm, I'm eager now because I want to be in the list Dr. Francesca showed, hopefully soon. You see? <laughs> yeah. Number of participants increased recently, so there is space. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, the most exciting projects <laughs> are in the Gulf region, yet none of the countries are members. Uh, there are reasons for that, but uh, we have to, reasons have changed, uh, no longer excuse. We have yeah. to uh, move forward. You and I will work on that. <laughs> so there is equilibrium in Asia. <laughs> for sure. Thank for you sure. all again. And... Uh, we can conclude here unless you have other remarks. Thank you. Okay. All good? Yeah. Enjoy you your dinner, much. Professor Oka, Francesca, yeah. your lunch. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you in conferences. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you so much. Bye. 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 Cheers. Welcome.